Romans 12, 9. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this body of believers. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the guidance it brings our hearts and the nourishment it brings our souls. We pray along with Paul here that we are strengthened to be genuine in our love, uh, that our love be honest and real and sincere, um, open to receive others, yet anchored to what's true and best for the uh, encouragement of one another. Um, we pray for strength to abhor what is evil, to hate uh, that which is not of you, which is not good. Uh, may it be a, a stench in our nose and, and turn our stomachs when we encounter evil. Um, but let us cling to what is good. Let us hold fast uh, to, to what is pure and right and holy and just and pleasing in your sight. Um, give us affection for one another, a brotherly affection that is deep, um, that endures, um, that will not separate us from one another um, because we are born in Christ with one another. Um, may we outdo one another in showing honor. May we be respectful to those that are deserving of respect and and give honor to whom honor is due, um, and, and let us outdo one another in those, uh, in those acts and in that gifts of mercy and grace. Um, may we be enthusiastic in our ministry. Uh, let us not be lazy and, and whimsical, um, but let us pursue you and serve you with intensity, um, finding ways to be part of your body, to minister to one another, um, to take care of the needs of the saints. Um, and to be hospitable. And Father, finally, we know that if we're regular in prayer, uh, give us the strength to be consistent in that and reading our word um, so that when we endure suffering, um, we will know that the suffering we find in this world uh, is the worst that we will ever have to endure, um, that your promise waits us in glory and that there will be no more suffering so that we may be able to delight truly in your plan and in your sovereignty and find hope and all of that. And it's in your son's name we pray. Okay. Did I miss any blanks? We'll start there. Any missing blanks? They're pretty straightforward this morning, right? I mean, I did good. It's a do gooder. Me and Superman. Sorry, that's a grammar joke, Renee. Sorry. Okay. Any, uh, any, if there's no questions in the blanks, any questions from this morning? I got tons of rabbit trails we could go down, but um, any thoughts or questions from this morning? Renee, what you got? I don't believe it. No? You got nothing? Not this time? Linda, what you got? The mic, oh, this is the microphone. Other side. Other side, Linda. There you go. I think he's going to zig and he zags. Okay. So in uh, John five seventeen, when yeah. Jesus is saying, my father is always, you know, they, is there in the Greek or something different in the way he's saying that? Because we all, as believers, say God is our father. So there must have been something in the way he was saying that. Because even they would say God is their father. So not I wouldn't ask. Well, pause. Israel corporately. I, I cannot find any Old Testament passages where an individual calls God their father. Solomon praying for the dedication of the temple can speak of the nation and say you are our father. But I do think Jesus teaching of calling God father in, in teaching his disciples to pray is a significant development. I'm not aware of anybody in the Old Testament calling out father to God. First off. But. Even if that's fine, the issue isn't that he's calling God his father. The issue is he's claiming divine prerogative. So to, un to unpack the argument, right? So you've got Jesus heals the man by the pool. He gets up and he carries this mat on his shoulder. And as best as we can tell, extra biblically, there is some rabbinic discussions about whether or not God keeps the law. 
I get this from Carson's been helpful on this. Um, you don't need to know that to understand the passage, but even amongst the rabbis, there wasn't a full consensus about whether or not, does God keep the law? And, and one group would say, well, he has to keep the law because the law is good. Well, if God keeps the law, well, then wouldn't the universe cease to exist every seven days? And so there's this debate back and forth whether or not God's working on the Sabbath. And we know he rests from his work in the creation week, right? Um, so Jesus' answer is not, let me pause. Go to chapter 7 where he does make the argument that he could have made here. Jesus could have avoided trouble, or at least much of it, if he'd given the answer here in 5 that he gives in 7. Um, so in 7, or is it 8? I think it's 7. Um, where is it? Uh, yes. No, no. Before that. Um, so look at verse 18. The one who speaks in his own authority seeks his own glory, but the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and in him there is no falsehood. Has not Moses given you the law, yet none of you keeps the law? Why do you seek to kill me? The crowd answered him, You have a demon. Who is seeking to kill you? Jesus answered them, I did one work, and you all marvel at it. Moses gave you circumcision, not that it is from Moses, but from the fathers, and you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If on the Sabbath the man receives circumcision, so that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a man's whole body well? He's referencing chapter 5, the healing of a man by the pool. So get the nature of the argument. The argument saying, I don't think you could argue biblically I actually am working. If you recognize within the law that if the law of rest and the law of circumcision coincide, the priest circumcises and he's not breaking the law, that there is a priority in the law. And surely if circumcising a baby justifies doing some amount of work on the Sabbath and helping a whole man. He'll make the same argument elsewhere. And he says, look, if your donkey falls in a ditch, you get him out on the Sabbath. Acts of mercy are, are legitimate on the Sabbath. So Jesus could have argued that way in five. He could have said, look, really? You think I'm working? Really? Right? That's not the argument he makes. If he had, and so it's instructive to me because in seven, he's cap knowing he could argue that. He could give that as his answer. He's picking a fight here. Here's his answer in five. It's really simple. This is why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, verse 17, my father's working until now and I'm working. Now, the issue isn't that he's calling God his father. It's the qualitative equality he's giving. My, my father is working on the Sabbath, so I work. I claim the rights of God. If God does it, I can do it. And they get it, because look at the very next verse. This is why the Jews are seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his father, making himself equal with God. The issue there is the equality. Whatever privileges and prerogatives God has, I have, is what Jesus is saying. They pick up on it, and they're like, you got to die. So it's not tied up in the notion of calling God father. It's tied up in the equality of, of privilege that he's claiming. If God works on the Sabbath, well, so do I. By implication, and he's going to go on and make it clear, you've understood me. Everything I see my father doing, I do, including creating the universe, including raising the dead, including judging. Like Jesus means everything I see my father do, I do. And so they're, he's claiming full, this is a statement of equality with God. But it's hinging upon he works, so I'm working. It's, it's not fundamentally hinging on my father. I mean, he's informing the father relationship. And in John's gospel, it's interesting. He'll say, I will pray to my father and your father. Jesus is not comfortable saying our father with the disciples. Because the father, God the father is a father to Jesus in a qualitatively different way than he is to us. So yes, God the father is a father to Jesus. God the father is our father. But Jesus will use language like my father and your father, my God and your God. He, he's not, he's keeping himself separate. His relationship is unique. Um, but it's not fundamentally because he said father, it's the other bit. Does that make sense? No, you don't seem satisfied. Push back. Come on. It's okay. No, so, so they didn't consider God their father? Nationally. just I, I don't see the text in the Old Testament where any individual Jew is calling God father. Even David, for all of his intimacy, I'm not, I mean, maybe it's there. I'm not aware of it. Other than Solomon's, corp Terry, you got any? Oh, he stepped down. Okay. Um. <laughs> Terry, um, 
I'm not 100% certain. Can you think of any Old Testament passage where an individual Israelite calls God Father? Apart from Solomon, corporately, God, you are our Father. I'm not aware of any. There may be, it might be there. You're not going to prove me wrong. I just, it's, if you know of it, yeah. there you go. It's a pretty significant development. And it's part of the reason why the new covenant is greater than the old covenant. The new covenant gives us a spirit of adoption. by which, But see, our calling God Father is tied to, in Romans 8, the receiving of the spirit by which we call God Father. And the indwelling Holy Spirit is a new covenant um, specific gift. So the, the Old Testament saints, Jesus, the, we don't know how. The Holy Spirit is functioning in and among the Old Testament saints. Jesus says he is with you and he will be in you. But the indwelling Holy Spirit is a new covenant specific benefit. No? Huh? Okay, so I'm going back to the baptism now okay. then. Okay, back, go back to the baptism. Uh, because doesn't God say this is my son in whom I'm well pleased? So mm-hmm. he's already publicly yes. establishing yes. he's his father. Yes. Maybe the Pharisees weren't there to yes. know that, but. Yes. And so God calls him his son. Yes. It all depends what connections you make to this. It's, it's similar to Jesus calling himself the son of man. So Adam in Matthew's genealogy is called the son of God. Okay. Mm-hmm. Jesus says in John, um, where is it? Where's Mitchell and I knew? Is it not written in your law? You are, you are gods. If God calls them gods. Yeah. It's, is that seven? <clears throat> um, so God refers to Israel as his firstborn son. But in the Davidic covenant, I'll be to him a father, he'll be to me a son. It all hinges upon what, in what sense are you calling God your father? Adam is the son of God. The angels are the sons of God. So it all, it all matters. When God says, this is my son, what matters is, okay, what Old Testament referent is that connecting with? Is it just connecting with, he could just be saying he's an angel. This is the sons and daughters. We know, and the rest of the text makes clear, this is my son connecting with the Davidic covenant and the peculiar sonship of Jesus. But simply from God saying it, the fact that God speaks verbally is a big deal, but that he simply says it isn't enough to narrow it down. You need more revelation. It's it's Jesus saying son of man. Son of man is the title most predominantly used of Ezekiel in the book of Ezekiel. So when Jesus adopts that as his favorite title, it's kind of um, it's kind of uh, subtle because it's not going to raise the antenna of people who don't have eyes to see and ears to hear. It's not until Jesus makes it clear when he's being questioned by the high priest. Oh, no, I mean the son of man from Daniel. The one like a son of man to whom power and kingdom and glory was given to the ancient of days. One, so the so son of man could just be a reference to Ezekiel. And so as Jesus is walking around talking about the son of man, the Pharisees aren't trying to kill him because they don't realize he's talking about Daniel until he makes it clear to them. You will see the son of man coming on the clouds with glory. And then they rip their clothes and he's got to die because they get it. It's similar to what do you mean by son? So you, there are biblical senses. Israel is God's firstborn son. Adam's the son of God. The angels are sons of God. And there's the Davidic covenant. I'll be to him a father. He'll be to me a son. Simply saying son hasn't made it clear which one of those threads you're connecting with. Jesus is making it clear here. I'm talking about son like I'm an equal with God. And the, the discourse that follows makes that clear. Um, spells that out clearly as well. And that's where I was saying he's trying to guard against on the one hand, I'm not another God. And at odds with God. So you see his complete submission, his complete conformity to the Father's will. I do nothing on my own authority, right? But then he also wants to insist, but everything he does, I do. I'm not lesser in any sense. I'm not inferior in any sense. I have the same power, the same authority, the same prerogatives he has. And so he's guarding against little g God, and he's guarding against polytheism in in his, his, his exposition. But they pick up on it primarily because he's claiming to have the rights God has. That, that's, where they, they, he, that's where he makes himself an equal with God. It's not tied up in he called God his father. It's tied up on he's claiming divine rights. You, you, right, buy, you buy that? You with me? Because no, he, yes? he continues on then in 19 and after about yeah. calling himself that and continuing on in that thread with making that connection that God is his father. Right. But because of Solomon's temple dedication, that, there's no indication 
that we see in the Gospels, the Pharisees taking umbrage that Jesus teaches his disciples to say our Father. They might think it's a bit presumptuous. They might be a little like, oh, that's a bit much. But no one's, no one's persecuting them and, and trying to kill them because of that. When they, when they persecute Jesus for calling God his Father, it's a particular type of father-son relationship he's talking about that they're picking up on. And it's not until they pick up on those particularities that they get upset. And so that's, what I think, what's going on in John 5. Okay? Yes, Sarah. Oh, no, no, no. Microphone. I, we're not amplifying this, but we record this, and the six people who listen to the podcast get confused if you don't speak into the mic. So, um. Okay. So then when Paul says in Philippians that uh, Jesus doesn't t- make himself equal with God, um, he's talking about practically then not— no, He doesn't say doesn't make himself. He says he doesn't hold on to equality with God. Okay, yeah. Doesn't consider anything to be grasped. So does God have the right to not suffer? Jesus doesn't hold on to that right. Does God have the right to unending worship and adoration? Jesus doesn't hold on to that right. That's what he's, he's talking about the incarnation. At the incarnation, Jesus foregoes a tremendous amount of the privileges and rights due him. He, and the whole point okay. is he doesn't cling to them. It's not saying he's not equal. In fact, it establishes he is equal. What's amazing is he didn't cling to his, we're all about, give me my rights, right? Don't tread on me. Mess with the bull, get the horns. Jesus lets them go. He, sur- he I mean, there's the whole debate, what is it? He emptied himself and, you know. Um, but the point is, he isn't clinging to his rights. But he, he has the rights of equality with God. So he he's doesn't. acknowledging them, but he's not holding on to them. Exactly. Okay, exactly. Got it. It's not a statement that he doesn't have them. It's that he doesn't cling to them. He did not consider equality with God a thing to be clung to. A thing, you could, I suppose, read it in some English translations, a thing to be reached for, as if he'd be reaching too high. No, the idea is, and it's the next verse that makes it clear, he empties himself. He doesn't cling to it, he lets it go. He, he, he surrenders it. Um, no, good question. What else? Anything else? Another question. Oh, go for it. This is about the judgment. Mm-hmm. Um, so in John 12, Jesus says, I did not come into the world to judge the world, but to save it. We see in Revelation the great white throne judgment. And then we have in the Apostles' Creed that Jesus is coming back to judge the quick and the dead. Um, I haven't seen Rocky. I don't know what you're saying. What's that? Apollo Creed. Apo- Sorry, I was oh, trying to yeah, be funny. Right. Nice. Trying to be funny. Yeah, I'm okay. with you. Apollo okay. Creed. There you go. Okay, sorry. The Apostles' Creed. Yeah. So question is, yeah. can you can walk? me through that probably a little bit there jesus first coming and i think that's what ties to it i've not come into the world to condemn the world is not tied with judgment directly inadvertently there's judgment because the very fact that god has given grace makes people accountable when they reject it um but his second coming is all about judgment so it's not an absolute statement jesus has nothing to do with judgment even here in john 5 he says, the, I mean, look at John 5. He says, the Father has given all judgment to the Son. Look at verse 22. The Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son. That he's just not exercising that judgment now. He's on a rescue mission, a, a dying substitute mission. He's not on a judgment. But when he shows up in Revelation with a, t- with a tattoo on his thigh that says, King of kings, Lord of lords, and the title deed to the earth, that he makes war with his mouth. It cites Psalm 2. He'll rule with them with a rod of iron. It's all about judgment. Yeah. Absolutely. So it's linked primarily to the incarnation and the 33 or so years that he spent on earth is not fundamentally about judgment. It ties in with judgment, right? It's an inescapable correlative because the very nature of light coming in, whoever does not obey the Son, the wrath of God abides on him. But Jesus is coming primarily about saving the fact that judgment is a secondary effect for those who spurn such grace is a byproduct. It's not the main purpose of why he comes. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Okay. Yep. Okay. Other questions or thoughts on this? No? Yes? Anybody? I got rabbit trails we can do, but I still have a hard time believing Renee doesn't have any questions, but that's okay. Oh, microphone. Yes, sir. You know, what I saw to be significant when um, in John 5, 
and go down to 19 and he says what I see the father do whatever the father does the son does likewise I mean you know he's using human analogy when a son sees a father working or doing something what does the son by do imitate the father right okay so that's taking it to the point of everything and you know we can think of it this way also no man has seen God and lived. Right. God is not a physical being. But Jesus is saying, I've seen, and you know, as you stated in, um, in your sermon, that, and you brought it out so um, well, that that intimate relationship between um, the Father and the Son, that it's an eternal Trinitarian yeah. um, relationship. And so you know, when he says that, it's, it's like he's pouring it on now. He's not, he's <laughs> oh, not yeah. pulling back. Jesus is, you know, he's getting them more and more incensed because he, you know, they understand what he's saying. And now oh. he's saying, oh, you think that's something? Well, let's, let's go on through <laughs> the rest of the sermon. Yeah, let's work through John 5. This is, this is remarkable. John 5 is an amazing passage when you start to grasp what is what's happening here. Because here you're getting the foundation for why Jesus can say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. What do you mean? And you're right. The sonship Jesus is talking about is functional. It's, it's not dissent here. It's the same basis where Jesus can say, blessed are the peacemakers, they'll be called sons of God. It's the notion of like father, like son. And so the Jews would be well aware of the fact that the father teaches his son the family business, right? And so, like, let me pause for a second. God loves Jesus. God loves you and me. God's love for Jesus and God's love for you and me are very different things. The most notably different thing is we think of God's love fundamentally in grace, forgiveness, mercy categories. Does the Father forgive the Son? Show grace to the Son? No. So almost the entire way that you and I view God's love is not how the Father loves the Son. The Father finds the Son lovely. We look at it, it's an amazing God loves someone who is unlovely like me. We don't deserve love, so we, ba- we, we marvel at the grace and the unmerited favor and the kindness and the patience. The Father's never been patient with the Son once. He's never been merciful to the Son once. He's never been gracious to the Son once because the Son has never needed grace, mercy, forgiveness. And the one time he could have forgiven him on the cross, he doesn't. He punishes him, right? So God's expression of love to the Son, the way it takes form, is very different than his way his love takes form for us. So we, we learn about that in verse 20. For the f- Father loves the Son. Okay, how is that? If that love is not seen, does love acts, right? It's not just saying the father has happy feelings for the son. How does he show that love? Well, in our case, it's because he gave his son. He, the father loved the world and he gave the son for the world. Here, full and complete disclosure. Absolute, shows him everything he does. And how does the son show his love for the father? He imitates and does everything he sees the father doing. And so if you take Jesus at his word, what he's saying is, I see absolutely 100% everything the father does without exception. And absolutely everything I see the Father do without exception, I do. That's how Jesus can say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, because Jesus images the Father plus and minus nothing. Right? And you need both pieces. You need to both see the entire person, and then you need to image the entire person, and Jesus does both. And that's the basis of why Jesus can say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. But that also then means Jesus does some really, you and I can be called sons of God. We'll never be sons of God like this. We'll never be creating universes. We'll never be giving life to the dead. But Jesus makes it clear, and this is, as you're saying, is further incensing them. You haven't misunderstood me, guys. I meant what I said, right? Uh, so he says, um, Verse 20, greater works than these he will show him so they marvel. For as the father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the son gives life to whom he will. That's another divine prerogative Jesus says he has. For the father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the son. All judgment, that's mine, he says. So you and I can be called sons of God and that we go around and God's the ultimate peacemaker and we're little peacemakers. And to the degree that you make peace, you're like your father, you're called sons of God. We won't be making universes. We won't be giving life to anybody, but Jesus does. And so he means, he's pressing this image to its fullest possible application. I, and lest anyone misunderstand him, I absolutely mean what, you, what you're picking up on, I mean it. 
and I mean it all the way, full throttle, 100 percent. Um, so then we talk about worship. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. I mean, take that amazing statement. The Father wants me to receive as much honor as he receives. The God who says I give my glory to no one, the God whose name is Jealous, wants the Son to receive an equal share of honor. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death. Truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is, not na- and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. And then it goes further on through this discourse. I mean, so there's a massive statement of equality with God being made um, that he is guarding against any notion that he's in opposition to God. That, that's guarded against under the I only do what I see him do. I do nothing on my own authority. There's, there's not a single action Jesus takes that doesn't source itself in what he sees the Father do or in the Father's will. There's not a single action he takes that is unique to him. I do nothing on my own authority, at least in the incarnation that's true, and only what I see my Father and I doing. So there's no possible way to read this as Jesus is in conflict with the Father or Jesus is in any way competing with the Father. But make no mistake, even though he does nothing but he sees the Father, he can do nothing on his own, he's fully equal with the Father because he's capable of doing everything the Father does. And the Father wants him to receive the same glory. And he's given, given all judgment. And so you end up with really one of the most important statements for the, really for Trinitarian studies of what does it mean that God is one and yet that God is, yes, exists in the plurality. And Jesus is really pressing that issue here. Anyway, it's a fascinating passage. To me, the most remarkable passage, I don't have my head wrapped around, is verse 26. Um, For as the Father has life in himself, so he's granted the Son also to have life in himself. I'm not entirely sure what to make of that. It sounds an awful lot to me like, see if I get hit for heresy here. The Father has life in himself, I think, means self-existence. So I think... He's saying something like the Father's given self-existence to the Son, which I don't even begin to understand because it sounds like we're talking about square circles. But some theologians refer to this as eternal generation. The first thing to do when you hit a mystery in the Bible is give it a complicated name so you can feel better about it. So, no, I mean, reifying is a big... You, you feel a lot better. People fight about the Trinity. You believe in the Trinity. As if we understand it. I mean, we know God exists in threeness of fellowship and persons, and we know God is one. We know the Father is not the Son. We know the Son is not the Spirit. Those are about the extent of the positive statements I can make about the Trinity. The rest of it are just heresies. People think trying to piece it together, right? Um, Same thing here. I'm not entirely sure what to make of verse 26. (laughs) This ties even to our discussion. It's because of verses like 26 that I think I don't have my hands wrapped around it, and I'm afraid of spelling it out too much. But I think there's a very real sense in which the Son is sourced from the Father. I think that's what 26 is getting at. But it's, in, in other respects, above my pay grade. Like, what he's saying in verse 26 does sort of seem like square circles to me. Like, what are you talking about gifting self-existence? But, yeah. Um, no, Go. I was listening to a lecture by uh, Dr. Barrett, and he mentioned there are some things that are just not rational. Right. They're trans-rational. They transcend our rational understanding. It's not that they're irrational, because God is not an irrational God. Right. But it's beyond any physical um, understanding that we could ever understand or will ever understand, even in eternity, because there's that unique relationship between the Father, Son, and Spirit. And even though we're going to be wrapped up in it, right. it's still, it's like the relationship, well, okay, don't want to be a heretic, but <laughs> it's like the relationship between me and my wife is different between me and my wife and my son. Right. You know, we, we have a relationship, and we have a relationship with our son, but it's not the same. Right. We love each other, but the lo- love that I have for my wife and the love that she has for me is totally different. Right. And it's meant to be that way. Yeah. Can't explain it. Right. But 
that's just the way it is. So it's, you know, some things you just, I, I like the way he made that word up. I, I don't know if he made it up, but. What, what word? Transrational. Oh. It, it transcends yeah. rationality. You know, the way that we think, you yeah. know, we are always trying to put things in a certain box and, you know, quantify everything. Well, yeah, we can't. No, no, I, I agree. And most of the foundational doctrines of the Bible, there's mystery. I mean, okay, who wrote John's gospel? Did John write John's gospel? Did God write John's gospel? Was it a collaborative, collaborative effort 50-50? No. Jesus fully God? Yes. Is he fully man? Is he two people? No. Yeah. And so we say amen. So I think the danger of heresy would come in if I wanted to define verse 26 too fully. Something's going on here I, I can't wrap my head around. But it's, it's, uh, it's a remarkable statement um, in 26 that I don't fully get. He's given him authority to execute judgment because he's the son of man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. And that should have been for them some connection with Daniel because he says son of man, but they don't pick. But can you imagine how upset these Pharisees would be when he says something they say, whoa, 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 you're making yourself out to be equal with God. And then he has this discourse like, oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I'm going to judge everyone. I'm going to get the same glory as the Father. I'm going to be in charge of the resurrection of the dead. <laughs> I mean, yeah, they're trying to kill him. Absolutely. And don't think for a second it wasn't intentional. He could have given them the answer he gave in seven. He could have mollified them and said, well, you know, the priest circumcises on the eighth day. So in John's gospel, Jesus is sovereignly in control of escalating the tension with himself and the Pharisees. And here's a prime example where he ratchets it up significantly. Um, that's, that's a whole other issue. Event, the next gospel I intend to do sometime is John. John's fascinating. But Jesus is, is sovereignly in control of the timing of the crucifixion. In John's gospel, that shows up. Remember the two examples? First, with the wedding in Cana, his, what, his mother comes to him and he says, now's not my hour. Well, his brothers and seven do the same thing. They say, hey, look, why are, you, why are you going around secretly? Go up openly to Jerusalem. And he says, you, you, your concern is not with, with God's concern, but your concern is with man because it's not my hour yet. Well, the hour is always referring to the crucifixion, the passion. And so Jesus is timing the resurrection. And there's a sense in which if he's too open, too public, makes too big of a feel himself too early, the crucifixion, the, the Pharisees will try to kill him too soon. And so he's doing things, and I think that's how I have to take the miracle at Canaan. If I openly, publicly may turn the water into wine, it would conflict with my hour, I, I think is how it's taking it. And certainly the sign of Lazarus is when, they, when the Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead in, in John's gospel. That's when the Pharisees are like, okay, he's got to die, and he's got to die now. And so Jesus is, I think, meant to be seen as sovereignly in control of arranging the timing of the crucifixion. So if Jesus wants to escalate it with the Pharisees, I'd fit that in. He's like, and now it's time to ratchet it up a bit. And so he's, he's intentionally picking a fight here. I mean, he's not being quarrelsome. It's time for me to reveal some of my intentionality and in thinking to them that I know they're going to hate. Now is the time to reveal some of the truth to them that they're going to choke on and, and try to kill me for. So it's not like he's trying to pick, like, poking them in the eye. But he didn't have to reveal this information here, and he does. And they hate it, and they want to kill him. And in John's Gospel, this is, the fight is now on. You know, because the Pharisees have shown it before in three with Nicodemus, and they're, they're sizing him up. It's kind of like dogs sniffing. You know? <laughs> Let's see what make you. But here, it's, okay, you're making yourself equal with God. You've got to die. And Jesus is in control of that. Yes, sir. Microphone. Regarding fully God and fully man, and the day and the hour unknown. The Son doesn't know, only the Father. There's a difference there. Does that pertain just to the Son of Man? So on one side of his brain he knows, yeah. and the other side he doesn't? Um, I mean, you, you can't make a blanket statement that the Son knows everything the Father knows right. without explaining that. Yeah, my... My best understanding, and granted, we're piecing in blanks of the incarnation, tying with what Sarah asked about the kenosis, emptying himself. Jesus, I would say, my, my best guess, but I think it's sound, is that the Son voluntarily surrenders the independent use of many of his divine 
um, attributes. Well, in doing that, that means the son doesn't know as much as the father. During the incarnation, the son certainly doesn't know as much as the father. Pardon me? During the incarnation, the son certainly does not know as much as the father. Luke has him growing in wisdom. Okay. Um, so, so I got no problem saying during his, in his, in the 33 years of his incarnation, Luke has Jesus learning in Luke two, clearly learning the son, Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and with favor with God and man. He begins and closes this, the episode of Jesus in the temple, sitting at the feet of the teachers, learning from them. He brackets that with that statement. Uh, he grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. So Jesus didn't come out of the womb knowing how to speak and knowing how to walk. Jesus, I think, my best, now, how do I explain that? Here's my attempt to explain that. Jesus gives up, I won't utilize my omniscience. I won't make use of it. Okay, so He doesn't lose it. He just doesn't use it. Yeah. It's, is it fair to say he wasn't equal to God? I mean, when he said, who touched me? Right. Some people say, well, he's just trying to draw somebody out. But mm. could it be the truth that he really didn't know? Who touched him? What I would be comfortable saying is functionally, economically, Jesus, for a little while, is made lower than the angels. I think I'm quoting Hebrews. For a little while, functionally, Jesus certainly has less glory, less power, less knowledge than the Father. So when you say um, the Son is equal, you must refer to a certain part I mean, of his I mean, sonship. I mean, the, cate- the philosophical categories, I mean, is ontology, being, essence. Let, let me give you the best analogy I can think of. Imagine... I have a, uh, a Ford Explorer with all the bells and whistles. I have the Supreme package, heated seats, everything. And you just have the regular Ford Explorer. Further imagine I had a switch that could turn off all of those bonus features. I, when I flip the switch, I could then say, driving my car is the same as driving your car. At no point did my car stop being the super deluxe model. Functionally it became equivalent of you when I turned the switch off, right? Functionally, the experience of driving the super deluxe version with all the bells and whistles turned off is the same as driving your car, right? To sit in my driver's seat, sit in your driver's seat, same thing. At no point in time does my car stop being the deluxe model. So if Jesus turns off, as it were, surrenders the independent use, what I mean by independent is the Father in the Gospels can prompt him, I believe, to know when to use his powers, with the things. I believe that's in the spirit. Luke frames Jesus' miracles as he returned in the power of the spirit. So Jesus' independent use, that's why I add independent, of his divine powers. He doesn't lose them. He doesn't stop having them. He's just not utilizing them. He's not making use of them independently. Yeah, I understand that analogy yeah. somewhat, but I think God, the human, the son's humanity, I don't think had that switch. What do you mean the sons he made? I'm, what do you when he was human, he didn't he didn't have the you know like who touched me or I don't know uh, about the day and the hour. I it don't think he just flip a switch and say okay now I know and then turn it back off. I think while he was human, he actually didn't know some things. But isn't he still human? Pardon me. Isn't he still human? Uh, I don't know. That's a whole different subject I'm struggling with. <laughs> I, no, I, I, would, I, I do know Jesus is still the God-man. Um, he wasn't temporarily the God-man. He, he is still the Son of Man, God in the flesh. He's eternally the Son of Man now. He had a, it, the Son of Man had a beginning at the Incarnation, but he is, is, yes. So during the Incarnation, Jesus' glory and his abilities and his powers are limited. So I, even though the text doesn't say this, I think it's a necessary conclusion that Jesus, after being exalted, does know the day and the hour of his return. And when he makes a statement, the Son of Man doesn't know. It's limited to the incarnation. The text doesn't tell me that. But I think it's a good and necessary well, conclusion. Well, it definitely is limited to his incarnation. Yes. But then when you say he's equal to the Father, don't yes. you have to explain that equality was adjusted during his carnality? Well, that's why I'm saying I don't, I don't think, John, th- this get ties in with the issue of eternal sonship. I think that a lot of what Jesus is talking about here precedes the incarnation. He sees the Father doing everything. John's gospel begins with the creative act. So he echoes Genesis 1, right? In the beginning was God, and 
in the beginning was God and the words with God. Equingenesis 1, he moves to creation and we find out the particular agent of creation is the son. All things came into being through him and apart from him, nothing has come into being that has come into being. So one of the things that the son does, I would say, that he sees the father doing is create. But if that's a function of his sonship, his sonship predates the incarnation, then, doesn't it? If if I could call one of the things the son seeing the father doing that he does is the creation of the universe, then okay, his yeah, functional sonship predates the incarnation. I understand where you're going, but it, yeah, yeah. It, it doesn't say in the beginning was the son. It says no, no. in the beginning, beginning was, was the, word. the word. Yes. And there's, that's a whole different. Yeah, yeah. No, no. I got you. Trail. I'm, I'm saying I think that to understand what he's saying here in five transcends the incarnation. The judgment isn't taking place during the incarnation. Mm -hmm. The resurrection of the dead isn't taking place during the incarnation. So when Jesus talks about his full equality, he has a bigger scope than the 33 years he's on earth because the judgment is beyond the scope of that. So, yeah, if you take Jesus as a whole outside of not just limited to his incarnation, he is fully equal with God, fully equal with God. And I think you have to take him outside the scope of the 33 years to make sense of some of these comparisons. Does that make, does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, somebody take this microphone away from me. <laughs> you're fine. You're fine. Man. No, no. And no, and don't, this stuff boggles the mind. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, I think when you look in um, Daniel 7. Yeah. And you see him being um, presented to the Ancient of Days. Yeah. And so when it goes down and he says uh, in 14, at the latter part, that all languages, nations, people's languages and nations, uh, should serve him, and his dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away. So if his dominion is everlasting, when did that begin? <laughs> yeah, it's everlasting. There is no beginning to that dominion. So Christ has always had dominion. God has always had dominion. And in you know, trying to um, parse out when was Christ not God or not equal with God, I think we have to, you know, look and see how does the Bible present him. Right. You know, in that one scope, um, he humbled himself mm -hmm. and took on the form of a servant mm -hmm. and was and became obedient unto death, even death on the cross. Jesus even said that I could right now call to my father and he would send, you know, Nations a legion of angels. Of angels. Yeah. So he was continuously humbling himself. Let me, I'm, I'll, you reference Dr. Barrick, I'll reference one more Dr. Barrick and we'll close our time. He, uh, so, so John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word. In the beginning the word was already being. And um, the imperfect tense of the verb, past continuous ongoing action. He, he would say this way, as far back as you go, Jesus is ising. <laughs> no, no, go back to beginning. Go back to the very beginning. And Jesus doesn't start being, he's in the process of being. He's ising. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's bad grammar, but you get the idea. As far back as you go, he's continuing to exist. He doesn't start existing. He continues. You're like, oh, there's Jesus being. <laughs> and it was, it was a, help, a memorable way to remember that as far back as you go, the word was being. He didn't start to be or become, which in John's gospel really is the contrast because um, it, all things literally it's created is become. Ginnamai. All, all, everything that has become became through him. And then he introduces John. And there became a man from God, John. And in contrast to all these things that become, the word is. Which is why when he eventually says the word became flesh, it's like, whoa. Because now you, he really, I think John really means he is entering into creation. I mean, it's not he appears to be or he looks to be. The word's becoming something. The word becomes flesh and pitched his tent among us. So anyway, we're at time. Godspeed. God bless. Good day.